Alright people, don't forget to subscribe and hit the bell notification. That way you'll know when I upload the next video and you'll be supporting my channel. Follow me on Twitter. Every time I upload a new video, I'll be tweeting. Ladies and gentlemen, this is your reaction. This is Rome, the Punic War, the first Punic War extra strip part one by the channel Extra Credits. Yes, the salty days, I guess. I remember that scene from the Doherty series. It's just fucking epic. Yeah, extra Credits is gonna talk about this in detail. This is from 2013, so I guess this is one of the earliest one that this channel did. All right. Remember, if you like my reaction, don't like, subscribe. So I know we start videos to react to more. I guess check out the reaction today. There's a link in the description. Check out the cast for all the plays like History, uh, John Tron, uh, Warhammer 40k and others yeah let's watch this one and follow me on twitter there i'll be tweeting every time you know upload a new reaction video that way you're i guess informed let's watch it hey everybody welcome to extra history i'm dan that's james and this is allison we usually make videos talking about games but today we are here to talk about rome a few months ago we got well, a call from the, the first. creative assembly probably one of the coolest we ever received and they told us hey so we're finishing up our next total war game and we've got some money left over in the marketing budget from our publisher the way we see it, we could buy a few more banner ads, or we could underwrite you guys making some videos to teach people about Roman history. You don't have to mention us or the game, just teach some history. And we said, that's awesome. And we are going to mention them and their game because I would love to see more companies do this. I want to see companies use their ad budget to not only garner sales, but also do some good. So to everybody else marketing a game that has something worth discussing, there are dozens of content creators out there who can do a lot more for you than a few banner ads are going to. So good on the folks at Creative Assembly for setting an example. We approve. But let's get started, huh? We are going to be talking about the Punic Wars, because they're less well-known than the campaign. Well, around this time, this was one of the first video that people sponsored or something, the way he talks about it, I guess. Uh, this is, I guess, probably not the first, but around this time, it was becoming a new thing, I guess. Sponsored content. Of Caesar or the Civil Wars of Augustus. We're going to probably spend most of our time focusing on the Second Punic War because it is just freaking awesome. It's got everything you want out of a great fantasy novel. Blood it says the first revenge, Punic War. bloody battles, brilliant generals, political intrigue, unbelievable feats of heroism, a clash of two mighty dynastic clans. Heck, it's even got fighting monsters, which I'm going to get to in the next episode. So what were the Punic Wars? Well, they were the wars between Rome and Carthage for control of what was, to them, the whole world. I can't even begin to tell you how much rested on these conflicts. This was 3rd century BC's World War II. Rome and Carthage were the two big powers in the Mediterranean, and only one of them was going to be walking out of this one alive. We are still seeing the impact of this war even today, thousands of years later. Without the Punic Wars turning out the way they did, I bet you the United States Senate wouldn't be called a Senate, and our money wouldn't say e pluribus unum on the back. Without the Punic Wars, I bet you Latin would not be the foundation for most of the Western European languages, and Roman laws wouldn't be serving as the basis for law systems around the world. These wars would make Rome the dominant power in the West for the next 700 years, and shape the course of history as a result. Now some of you may still be scratching your heads at the name Punic War. Where did that come from? After all, Punic doesn't really sound anything like Rome or Carthage. Well, see, the people who originally settled Carthage were Phoenician, which is how the Romans usually referred to them. Only their pronunciation of the word sounded more like Ponician, which then used as an adjective became Ponic or Punic. You know, it doesn't matter. The point is, ancient Roman writers called these the Punic Wars, which basically to them meant war with Carthage. And we have just stuck with the word they used. Cool fact though, the word Punic still means treacherous in English. I bet you that wouldn't be true if Carthage had won these wars. But okay, the Punic Wars were wars between the two most important powers in Europe for dominance of the whole... Well, <coughs> Romans do, do that a lot, right? Butcher the names of the uh, other people, I guess. Uh, they call Greek Greeks instead of Hellas or well, Hellenas, whatever they're called at the time. So, yeah. In caboodle. So let's introduce our protagonists. In one corner, we have Rome, recent conquerors of Italy. Well, okay, most of Italy. The Gauls still held the northern bit where Milan stands today. Rome was a republican oligarchy, meaning they were a democracy, but most of the decision-making still fell to the rich. Romans held military glory in the highest regard, and made military service an essential part of political advancement. In the other corner, we have Carthage, based in the city of Carthage on what is now the northern coast of Tunisia. They were also a republican oligarchy, but more focused on trade. Wealth was the prime determiner in political mobility there, and they would use mercenaries to fight their wars instead of citizen soldiers. At the time our story begins, Carthage controlled most of northern Africa, a little bit of Spain, and several of the major islands in the Mediterranean. And it's that handful of islands that got everybody into trouble. Yeah. You see, the First Punic War broke out over the island of Sicily. The actual causes are almost comical. It started when a group of Italian mercenaries, calling themselves the Mamertines, were invited into a city and basically got bored and decided to capture it. 
They then became pirates and raiders, and then, when somebody finally tried to stop them, they appealed to the Carthaginians, whose city they had technically just stolen, to come and help them out. And Carthage did so, but the story doesn't end there. After the Carthaginians bailed them out, the Mamertines decided they weren't so happy having to obey the Carthaginian rules now, and so they appealed to Rome on the pretext that, hey, come on, we're Italians, asking the Romans to help them free their city from the Carthaginians who had just helped them. This, of course, turned into the First Punic War, a grinding conflict- Well, they are true to their words, the pirates, right? Who gives a fuck who they screw over, over and over again? I mean, <laughs> as pirates can be, they are the proper pirates that took 20 years, cost almost a fifth of the male population of Rome, and had over a million soldiers involved in the fighting. Just take that in for a second. A million soldiers. Do you know how long after the fall of Rome it would be for a European war to include a million men? The 16th century. And here yeah. they were doing it in the 3rd century BCE. And all because of some idiots getting bored in Sicily. So a million is a big fucking number, right? Way, way long. Even in the, I guess, Napoleonic Wars, you know, hundreds of thousands, half a million was like, oh, holy shit. I'm just going to skim over the events of the First Punic War, but for our purposes, the First Punic War was a back and forth with, in the loosest of terms, the Carthaginians slowly losing on land, while the Romans managed to bungle a series of naval engagements, and in general just make a mess of things at sea. This was, after all, Rome's first experiment with doing anything outside of Italy, and the first time they'd ever built a navy. In fact, one story goes, they didn't even know how to build warships, and so they had to copy a Carthaginian ship that washed ashore. <laughs> just anyway, next... once the Romans yeah, finally... Yeah, next is some next level shit, man. How good you have to be that you just see... A ship that basically crashed there. Hmm, look at that how they're made. The crash ship. Not a proper ship. A crashed one. They just say, hmm, let's see how they are making it. And just makes a ship after that, just observing that. That is some next level shit, man. They managed to get the whole navy thing down and started winning at sea. Carthage capitulated. I highly recommend you dig further into that war sometime, because I am really glossing it over. But that should serve to catch you up on the backstory to our main event. The Second Punic War. And the key to our tale, the piece that ties the First and Second Punic War together, is a man named Hamilcar Barca, a general for the Carthaginians on the island of Sicily during the First Punic War. See, the thing here is, he didn't actually lose that war. After the naval defeat that caused Carthage to throw in the towel, his army was still intact. So he returned to Carthage with his troops, troops expecting to get paid, because they're mercenaries, yeah. because that's how Carthage fights wars. Unfortunately, Carthage, what with the cost of the war, the reparations imposed on them by the Romans, and the interruptions in trade and such, were in no position to be paying anybody. They basically came out and said, Sorry guys, we have not got any money. Could you all just kindly return to where you came from? You can probably guess how well that went over. Short version, those troops were soon besieging Carthage. In a see, see, I don't understand the Carthage's mentality. I mean, at one, uh, one side, if you see that, like, okay, just fight the wars with mercenaries. You don't have to force your own people. You don't have to, I guess, conscript your own people and everything. But what about the allegiance? I get it. As far as you're rich, I mean, you have an army, sure, because who's going to pay more to this mercenary than you? I guess it works. But what if one day you're not rich, like happened here? What if you're not rich and you can't pay or maybe somebody else can pay more than you? Your entire army falls apart. I mean, it, it would work in short term in certain conditions, that's it. And it would be really good shit because your, pe your people would be really happy. Like, holy shit, we don't have to die to defend our own self? Yes, yeah, that's fucking awesome. But that, that's not stable. Carthage would have fall if, if not for Punic War, there would have been a war that would have, you know, crushed Carthage anyway. For, for this uh, simple shit as this, just using mercenaries. Panic, Carthage called upon who else but Hamilcar, and made him ride out and defeat his own army. So he hired some more mercenaries, promising to pay them up front this time, and over the next two years, he did just that. But Hamilcar held in his heart a secret resentment and a burning hatred. A hatred for the Romans who'd humiliated him in the city he once idealized. And a resentment against the old men of Carthage who he'd felt stabbed him in the back, never giving him the Makes troops sense. or the resources he needed to win a war that, by all rights, he should have won. He began to distance himself from what he considered the weak city fathers in Carthage, more concerned with their coin and their trade routes than fame and everlasting glory. So when they later turned to him to ask how to repay the crushing war debt they owed to Rome, he put forth an idea he'd been toying with in the back of his mind he proposed raising a new army to secure their African holdings. To this, the old men readily agreed. But once Hamilcar had his army trained and ready, he immediately crossed to Europe to reestablish the Carthaginian Empire in Spain, stopping only to make one last offering to the gods before he crossed, an offering upon which he made his young son Hannibal swear an oath of vengeance. Never be a friend to Rome. And with that, he made straight for the silver mines in the south. God, the Hannibal. <laughs> he, he literally just, you know, walked around the way, all the way to Rome, killing t 
funds of elephants and shit. I don't know. But the, the guy was badass, but I don't know why that shit is way too hilarious for me. It got the, you know, eye infection or something that he just, you know, cut out his eye or something. That's just fucking... ...the Spain. <laughs> By the time the Carthaginians found out about it, silver had already started flowing back to Carthage, so no one questioned his usurpation of the army, or the complete lack of oversight of his activities in Spain. So Hamilcar then began to push east, carving out an unofficial kingdom in Spain for himself and his family. But opposition to his advance was fierce, and it took him four years of constant war to push all the way to the eastern coast of Spain. Over these four years, his raw army from North Africa became one of the most formidable fighting forces in the world. Over time, these men went from being mercenaries to being an army loyal to the Barkid family. Many of these same men would follow Hannibal over the Alps years later. Another story we're going to be talking about later. When really? Hamilcar's forces reached the eastern coast of Spain, Rome started to get a little bit worried. After all, here was not only a Carthaginian, but the very general who had fought them in Sicily, with a very large army, only a short hop across the water from Rome itself. So they sent a delegation to ask Hamilcar what he thought he was doing with an army that close to Rome. Hamilcar simply replied, I am gathering the booty we need to pay you the reparations we owe from the last war. They couldn't really argue with that, so they packed up and went home. You gotta love a guy with the wit and stones to say something like that. I am just invading this territory so we can pay you. How awesome is that? From there, Hamilcar continued his conquest, heading north and eventually founding- that, uh, that is awesome at the level is that like money is just a concept. You want money, we can do it right now. We can just snatch money from the next town, right? I don't, I, I don't, I don't care about all that. You want to pay, get paid, just tell me and we will invade some town or something. A city we know well today. Some of you may have already guessed it from his last name, but he named the city Barcino after his family, a place that we now know as Barcelona. Yet again, we see the echoes of the Punic Wars in our current world today. Shortly thereafter, Hamilcar died. The details of his death are extremely unclear, and there are many stories about how he died, but the one I prefer to believe is that he died leading his enemies away from his young sons Hannibal and Hasdrubal so that they could make their escape. For the next seven years, the Spanish territory was expanded by Hamilcar's son-in-law, who was also named Hasdrubal, just to make things confusing. Hasdrubal, the son-in-law, ruled well and fairly by all accounts, until his assassination in 221 BC. But for the purposes of our story, the most important thing he did was make a treaty with the Romans at one point, agreeing upon the borders of the Carthaginian territories in Spain. A treaty that will serve as the cause for the Second Punic War. Join us next time when the Second Punic War really fires up, and oh, we yeah. dive into the drama of the crossing of the Alps and watch the clash of famous champions like Hannibal, Scipio, and Fabian. See you then! I knew it. He wasn't going to talk about Hannibal in this video, but yeah, Second Punic War. We're definitely going to talk about it in the next video. So, okay, he's going to touch all the Punic Wars. How many Punic Wars were there? I guess the next video is the second Punic War. Is that it? Is this, this is only two part series? I don't know. I only seen two, two parts so far. Yeah. I love the, you know, the most uh, famous comment on this uh, video is, see guys, Rome 2 wasn't a complete, the game basically, Rome 2 wasn't a complete fillet, it led to the birth of this series, extra history, which we all love. Seriously, this is literally the first extra history, I love that. Alright people, that was the Rome, the Punic War, the saltiness, I guess, we're gonna experience in the, uh, I guess, last part of this series. If you like Berikson, don't forget to like and subscribe, check out the Rick Sandy, there's a link in the description, check out the castle, place, and yeah, I'll see you next time.